The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'm the host for this podcast. I want to remind you to give us a good rating wherever you listen to podcasts, if you like our podcast, assuming that you do. And also check us out on YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, if you go to the addictionpodcast.com, you can sign up for our email list and I will tell you that we don't spam you. We simply send a weekly email to tell you about what episode has just gone live. And we are assuming that that's something that you would want to know. So be sure and subscribe to our email list. You can do it right on our website. Um, today we have an interview and this interview is with a doctor. Her name is Libby, short for Elizabeth Stout. She is a board certified addiction psychiatrist and has worked in the addiction behavioral, behavioral health field since 1990. She was the medical director for the Circle Program, a 90 day inpatient treatment program funded by the state of Colorado for persons with co-occurring mental illness and substance abuse who have failed other levels of treatment. She was instrumental in helping the circle program to become tobacco free in January, 2000. And she's been a strong advocate of the need to address all addictions at the same time, including tobacco. She has been actively incorporating complementary treatments into treatment programs, including the five point ear acupuncture, National Acupuncture Detoxification Association protocol, and other sorts of therapies that are perhaps not usually done in the field of addiction. She also has a lot to share with us about the THC that is in today's marijuana. So without further ado, let's talk to Dr. Libby Stout. So okay. here we are. Dr. Stout, thank you so much for being willing to be on the podcast and sharing your knowledge with us because I know you have some interesting things to tell us. <laughs> I do. So, but to st go back a little bit and tell us, you know, tell us about you, how you got into the field of psychiatry, how that led you to addiction. Like, how did, how did you get where you are today with the interests you have today? Oh, I'm sorry. That's a very long story. It's okay. Uh, it's okay. I, I never, ever planned on being a psychiatrist. That was not in the plans. Uh, when I was in high school, my plan was to become a researcher. And I wanted to research and, and cure the world of cancer. And I thought the best way to do that would be through a veterinary school, because most of the research is done with vets and with animals. So I applied to vet school numerous times. I couldn't get in. I had the grades to get in. I just, I, they, every time I got an interview, you could go back and find out why you didn't get in. And they said, well, we don't see the, we don't see the justification for putting all the money to put somebody through vet school who's not going to practice veterinary medicine. Oh. And so I ended up going an alternative route. So I got a bachelor, I mean, I got a master's in biochemistry. I started doing PhD work at Vanderbilt. I was going to make a joke, Libby. I'm sorry that they wouldn't accept you as a veterinarian, but they would as a psychiatrist. And I was just going to say, uh, I'm just trying to think here, but okay, I'll be quiet now. Keep going. <laughs> Um, so I got a master's in biochemistry and then I was working on a PhD at Vanderbilt in pathology, working on cancer. And um, I got married and my husband couldn't get a job anywhere in the Nashville area. He got it in Lubbock, Texas at Texas Tech. And we tried the split thing for a while and that wasn't very fun. So I transferred to Texas Tech. And while I was there as a PhD student, I, I was kind of frustrated with what I was doing. I wasn't getting much direction. And they asked me if I would um, apply for medical school because they wanted to start an MD PhD program. And I initially said, well, I couldn't get into vet school. How could I get into medical school? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm questioning, okay? I'm just questioning that. <laughs> anyway, I did, I, I um, got into medical school. And as I'm doing medical school, I fell in love with everything. Uh, and so I'm doing research uh, and 
And it got very frustrating because my research ended up in OBGYN and my major professor was in biochemistry and my I was an anatomy graduate student and I couldn't get my committee to really agree to anything. And so I basically dropped out of doing the PhD because I thought, you know, you can do anything you want with an MD. So I, I finished medical school, but I didn't know what I wanted to do um, because I liked everything. And since my research was in OBGYN, I thought I would do that. Um, but my husband didn't want to move, so I just applied to everything there. And the, the chair of psychiatry was a really smart guy. And he said, well, why don't you just sign on with us and we'll let you do a rotating internship and then you can rotate through everything. And if you prefer something else, you can start with that. Uh, you can switch. And so I did. I did a month of everything. I learned a lot about myself that year. And I found out that I get bored very easily. And <clears throat> OBGYN was the same thing over and over and over again. And my fir first rotation in psychiatry was the chemical dependency unit. So working with substance abuse. I had no history of that in my family. I had no knowledge of it. So I was very naive, um, but I loved it. And the reason I loved it was to me, it was the only area of medicine where we actually teach people how to take care of themselves and how to recover. Wow. We don't do it for them. We teach them how to do it. Yep. And they can do it. And so that's why I stayed. And that's how I became an addiction psychiatrist. And so I, I went through the residency and, and uh, that was before they had fellowships for addiction. So I grandfathered in as an addiction psychiatrist. And so the past 30 years I've been working in this field and I absolutely love it because I see recovery as completely possible, totally possible. Yep. And, and so I've had a long career, but I, I originally was born in Denver and I always wanted to get back to Colorado. And so there came a job opening at the state hospital in Pueblo, Colorado. This was like 20 years ago. And I applied for it uh, because it was the medical director of a program that doesn't exist anywhere else. It's a three month inpatient treatment program for people with dual diagnosis. So people with mental health and substance use issues. Uh, and it's funded by the state of Colorado. So people don't have to have money to go through the program. Okay. And it has really great outcomes. And I came specifically in 1999 to make that program tobacco free because I have always believed that and that's a whole nother story. About yeah, and that. I know we'll get flack if you start talking about why people shouldn't smoke, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> I really think people do much better if they can go through an inpatient or residential program that's totally abstinence-based. Yep. You know, you could you that. could if you wanted to get into sugar and caffeine. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm not, oh, you know. absolutely. No, all of those things need to be, you know, kind of addressed and talked yep. about. Yep. Uh, and so... Um, so I, I did that program for, for 20 years. Uh, most of that time was at the state hospital, but the, the legislature kept trying to close it because it's an expensive program. And ultimately they were successful in closing it in 2017. Um, and so we got it reopened in the community where I helped them get it set up again. But um, I actually, retired from that job last year <clears throat> during COVID um, <laughs> because I was becoming more and more disillusioned about our high potency THC and the really dangerous effects I was seeing on patients. And I couldn't get anybody's attention. Nobody was paying attention to me. I was saying, this is like, and it got to be the point where I was saying, I think this is the most dangerous drug we have right now. Wow. Uh, mainly because it is so insidious and everybody believes that it's safe and it's medicine. But what we've allowed the industry to do is create these concentrates that are very, very high potent THC that are not medicine. Those are not medicine. <laughs> and it's, it's causing devastation with a lot of people. So it's anyway, like a Frankenstein marijuana. Yeah. Oh, it is. And so I basically retired from that job to spend more time trying to educate people and trying to get people to listen. And so for the past um, year, 
I've been doing a lot of talks uh, on marijuana and we've I've been working with several organizations in Colorado and we just got a bill passed. It is amazing. Bipartisan wow. support to um, really start putting some regulations on our marijuana and decrease the amount of concentrates that people can get, uh, improve the, the regulations around the young people getting medical marijuana cards when their brain is still developing and they can get anything they want and then getting control for looping and then actually having something like a PDNP that wait, we Wait have. a second, what is looping? Looping. Okay, so that is where <laughs> there is no control for it right now. That somebody can go to a dispensary and in the <clears throat> recreational market, you can get one ounce a day. In the medical market, you can get two ounces a day. If you look at it in terms of concentrates, you can actually get 40 grams of concentrate a day in a medical store. However, you can then go to the next medical store and get another 40 grams. And then you can go to the next one and get another 40 grams. And mm. so this is what we see happening with young people. That's just we, like the pill mills and the, and the oh, pain pills yes. and the Oxycontin. It's the same thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. But at least, you know, at least there's some research on Oxycontin. There is no research on things like shatter or wax. And so we have this thing in Colorado that we're hoping is getting tighter regulated. Uh, that 18 to 20 year olds cannot purchase alcohol or tobacco at 18 to 20. However, they can go to a doctor and get a medical card without parental consent or knowledge. And then they can go to the dispensary and get whatever they want. Wow. And so we have 18 year olds who are still in high school who are getting 40 grams. I mean, one bag of shatter is one gram. And there's 760 milligrams of THC in that one bag. Oh so, my goodness. So what they're doing is they're purchasing all these products and then they're selling them at school. And so this is why I've actually seen 14 year olds that have been using Shatter that was from a medical dispensary because they're getting it from their brother or their peer or whoever is, I got a card. OMG. I hope we have listeners from Colorado. I, you know, we get flack every time we talk about this, but there it is. Okay. The, you're yeah. Dr. Stout, so you are, you're an expert. You're an authority. You see this stuff. You're not just someone like me who's given her own opinion, which I'm very free to do, but yeah. you like Dr. Finn, you got the research to back it up. People, I hope you're listening. Yes, and it really needs to be people all over the country because this that's, is that's happening true. everywhere. Yep. And Colorado was the first state to legalize recreational. And so we're kind of supposed to be the model and everybody is using it as the model like, oh, it's okay to do anything you want. And it is really awful what we are seeing. So I was seeing a lot of people with very severe delusions once you get a delusion, it's not treatable. Psychiatric meds do not stop a delusion. And, wow. and, and they're really intense. And so this is what I, it was happening in my treatment program. And wow. really, really sad. Wow. I, I mean, just wow. So you've seen it. You've seen the effects firsthand of um, the long-term continued use of the high levels of THC that are available now. You know, it is such a fallacy when people say, A, that marijuana isn't addictive, and B, that it isn't a gateway drug. <laughs> that is such a fallacy, completely. And <clears throat> so I, I'm very much into alternative treatments, um, and I, I do train people in, in ear, a form of ear acupuncture. And so I've really studied a lot of the uh, traditional Chinese medicine approach to, to medicine. And if you think about, you know, marijuana has been in the pharmacopoeia of the Chinese herbal medicine, but that is the old time marijuana. So up until the 1980s, basically, THC was always less than 3% in the plant. 
-hmm. And so it's been around for centuries, yes, and it has been used as a pharmacopoeia kind of thing. And, and there is benefit from it. And there is some research that there is benefit from it. But all of the research that has been done is on the smoked plant less than 10% THC. Right. And we don't have any research on these concentrates, period. But they are available in the medical dispensary. And so this is what makes people think that it's safe. Oh, well, if that's medicine, then it must be safe and it's okay to use. And that's why families support it. You know, they don't get upset when their kids are just smoking marijuana until they actually then have the consequences. Right. And the consequences are severe. Um, the, the worst, of course, is psychosis. When people actually develop psychotic symptoms, they're delusional. They think people are out to get them. They think people are monitoring them, like the FBI or the CIA. And, and what I've seen with several people is if we can convince that person to quit marijuana and it's caught early enough, they can recover. Mm-hmm. However, I've seen people like get psychotic we stabilize them with medication antipsychotic medication then they're doing well for a period of time we take them off the antipsychotic medication and they're doing well until they start back to using marijuana and then they're right back where they were and then at some point it becomes permanent i mean there's there's nothing we can do about it wow Wow. That is so scary to me. I hope it's scary to the people who are listening who think that smoking this new marijuana or imbibing it however they imbibe it is safe. Um, Dr. Stout, just because you're a psychiatrist, how, pray tell, did you get into acupuncture? (laughs) I have to ask that question. I mean, you mentioned antipsychotics. That's the standard thing that happens right. with psychiatrists, and here you are. Yeah, that's a very long story, too. But um, <laughs> so I basically, it was a synchronicity thing, and that's one thing I've noticed, that if you're open to synchronicity, it happens, and it keeps happening over and over again. So I was in this new program in Colorado. I was making it tobacco-free, so I started uh, July 1999, we planned to make it Tobacco Free 2000, which we did. It was very successful. Uh, at the time, we had 30 patients as a 30 bed unit, and nobody left, um, and we all did quite well. But um, in December of 99, I went to a Triple AP meeting, which is the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. And Alan Leishner, uh, who was the head of NIDA at the time, was there during the cocktail hour. I think it's fascinating. This is an addiction meeting, but it's with the psychiatrist and they actually have a bar. Uh, And so um, (laughs) he was talking about how he had just been to Yale and had seen the most marvelous thing that was they were using as a treatment modality that should be in all treatment programs. So he started talking about people doing ear acupuncture and how they were studying it and they were going to publish it. And, and so I left that meeting, I went home to Colorado and the next day, this woman who I know as a medical acupuncturist called me and said, why are you not using the NADA protocol in the circle program? I said, that is so bizarre. I just heard about it. And then she said, well, next week we have Michael Smith, who is the guy who started the organization, um, coming to Denver to give a talk. Why don't you invite him to the state hospital and he can give a talk? And so I said, okay, sure. So we did all that. He came to the state hospital. He gave a CME talk. None of the psychiatrists were really very interested, except he needled the administrators. And that's all it took. They went, oh, this is wonderful. We feel so good. We need to get this here. And so we started. um, They paid a trainer to come and train five of us psychiatrists because at the time we thought, oh, that was the only people we could train. And um, I started using it in my program. And I was very skeptical because I'm a Western trained scientist. I you know, I initially thought, oh, this is mumbo jumbo. It doesn't really do anything, but I'm happy to try because I had heard that it helps the smoking cessation. And so I was making these people quit smoking. And so I'd have people come in smoking three pack a day cigarettes and I had to take them away immediately. And so I said, well, this is supposed to help you with that. 
we did nicotine replacement, but <laughs> we did the NADA protocol. And it was really amazing. And I started collecting data and I actually was able to prove to myself that this really does work. It's really, really helpful. It's not a standalone treatment. You can't just put needles in somebody's ears and everything's different. But it was originally developed to help people detox from heroin. Wow. Uh, and, you know, how it was initially really discovered was by a neurosurgeon in Hong Kong. This was in the early 1970s. And um, he he was using a form of electrical stimulation of one of the lung, the ear points called the lung point. And he was using it basically for preoperative analgesia to help people calm down before they had their head operated on. And he found that when he had people that were addicted to opium or heroin, they didn't have withdrawal. So he actually then recruited a bunch of those people and studied it and found that he could detox people off of heroin or opium just using ear acupuncture. And wow. so at the same time, this is another synchronicity thing, uh, in, the, in the United States, in New York, in the Bronx, there was a very severe opiate epidemic, right. very similar to what we have right now. But we didn't hear a lot about it because it was affecting mostly people of color. So it, um, it was affecting all these people who were poor and had were somewhat disenfranchised. And they were, so there's been a lot of resurgence of information about this time because it's fascinating. Uh, and so there's a new documentary that people can watch called Dope is Death, which is actually the history behind this, where the young lords who were people basically of Puerto Rican descent who had, you know, immigrated to the United States and living in New York, and then the Black Panthers who actually came mostly from the South and moved to the North, and they got together and they really helped change this society and helped uh, the young lords actually invaded the hospital, which was Lincoln Hospital at the time. They took it over and they insisted on health care, equivalent health care for them. And methadone had been discovered in the 60s. And so it was starting to be used. And this Lincoln Hospital was one of the first places to actually use methadone as a treatment for opiate addiction. But it was more of um, you know, like a chemical restraint and they were not very happy with it. So they didn't like methadone maintenance. And they read in the newspaper, the story about this guy in Hong Kong making this discovery. And so they actually went and got trained to become acupuncturists. And so all these, these young lords and Black Panthers were started treating people with ear acupuncture. Okay, there's I, a movie right there. There yeah. is an actual movie, young lords and Black Panthers using acupuncture to treat their people for addiction. Wow. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And I, I just, Democracy Now! yesterday had a story about a new one, a new documentary, and I, I'm blanking on the name of it, but it's also about the young lords taking over the hospital. Wow. Uh, and so this is, this is just fascinating because that's how this got started, but then it actually developed into an organization um, there's a lot more to the story, but simplistically, they developed an organization in 1985 where they started training people. So you could go to Lincoln Hospital and learn this procedure. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at the addiction podcast at yahoo.com or go to our website, the addiction podcast.com or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. Sometimes the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. 
Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. Um, but now we have it all over the country and um, people are being trained. The laws are very depending on the state. Uh, and so in Colorado, we have a very nice law where we are allowed to train pretty much anybody. Uh, and so I've been training uh, peer mentors, people that have gone through the training to be, um, you know, help their peers who have been in recovery. And when I, when I do the trainings, I have an application where I ask people to, you know, tell me why you want to be in the training. And I get some really great stories about people saying, well, when I was in treatment or when I was attempting recovery, I experienced this ear acupuncture and it was so helpful. I want to be able to, you know, provide it for my friends and my peers. I, th I think it's fascinating. I, I just, I, it's amazing. And it's definitely something that, you know, I think is better than just trying to substitute one drug for another drug, which as we know, never works. So if I can get you back to THC, <laughs> you've got this law now in Colorado. I'm thinking, well, I'm thinking you guys need to go national with it, but what's next? What is the next thing that you're gonna try and do, you misretired psychiatry lady? <laughs> okay, well, we don't wanna be premature on this because it still needs the governor's signature. Oh. And the governor has been somewhat pro pot, um, but but because this was this was passed so hugely, like it passed unanimously in the Senate, and in the House it passed fifty eight to seven or something like that. So um, it was and it was supported by all kinds of organizations. So I can't imagine that he would veto it. Although I think he is getting pressure from the industry to veto it. But I hope that doesn't happen. Yeah. I hope that he actually signs the bill. And it's just a start because it isn't anything that we started with. I'm because, sure. You know, we started, actually how I got started doing this was after I retired. Well, I had already belonged to this organization, which is a task force um, in Colorado, working with the, those in the criminal justice system uh, who have mental health and substance use issues. And... I was pointing out to them when I joined that organization, that group, what I was seeing in my program at the state hospital, the circle program with the THC. And, and one of the concerns they were having was that, you know, they have all these people that can't develop competency, though they've committed a crime and now they're not competent because they're psychotic. And I, I was saying, I think a big part of that is this THC. Huh. And we need to look at that. Huh. And so they asked me to write a white paper. So I wrote a white paper about high potency THC and basically got the endorsement of this organization. And then we went on to the attorney general's task force and got them involved. And then I got hooked up with these other organizations like Smart Colorado and Blue Rising together. <clears throat> and we were able to then start doing these education pieces for the legislators. And so we would meet one-on-one -on -one with the legislators. And of course, this is Zooming because it's COVID. And, and so I would give a presentation slide-wise on terms of all the problems we're seeing with the high potency and all the products that are available. And it was amazing. People were kind of blown away. I mean, these are our legislators and they don't even know what's available, what's out there, what's happening to people. And, and so um, we initially wanted to put a cap on THC and that was a no-go with the industry. They would not even consider it. <laughs> However, I, I, I mean, there's precedent. So like one of the things that's, you know, there's a lot of research from around the world and in the Netherlands where they've always been pretty tolerant of marijuana, they even made this <clears throat> realization that when their potency in the plant got up to 20%, there was a lag time, but there was this increased need for treatment for cannabis use disorder. So they and many other researchers have been able to demonstrate that the higher potency causes a lot more addiction. 
And so they, in 2016, actually came out and said they believe anything higher than 15% THC should be considered a hard drug like cocaine. And they capped the potency at 15%. So that was what we were attempting to do. We do not have a potency cap at all. Right now, our concentrates average potency is 69%. Wow. Um, but we have them all the way up to 99.9%. <laughs> wow. This is, this is insane. This is yep. crazy. Yep. But, um, and so, you know, this is just the beginning. We're, we're going to have to continue to push on this because um, I, I think people just need to realize that this is very serious. I was just going to ask you, I, I, I agree completely. So I'm... Let's say I'm a parent and I have a teen that is experimenting with marijuana and I don't think it's such a big deal. What would you say to me to maybe change that viewpoint? Well, I suppose if, um, well, any use of any potency as a teenager is dangerous. And that's because of how it affects the developing brain. And that's what I think we need people to understand. So we need a whole lot more education in the whole general public about this. Because one of the best things that has come out of all this commercialization of marijuana is a better understanding of our own natural endocannabinoid system. Now, I, I like to point out that we did not really even know why people liked marijuana until the 1960s, even though it's been around for centuries. Nobody really understood it until this lab in Israel were taking apart the different cannabinoids and injecting them into rhesus monkeys. And they found that when they gave rhesus monkeys THC, they were calm and sedate. And then they found that there was a receptor in the brain that THC fits into perfectly. And that's how it got named a cannabis receptor, which I think is very sad because that now makes people believe we have this receptor in our brain that means we're supposed to smoke cannabis. But that's not true because it was the same lab and other researchers around the country, the world, who in the 1990s discovered why we have those receptors. Mm. So they discovered that we have this, our own natural endocannabinoid system. This is our homeostatic system. This is a system to balance us. And so we have these receptors and we make chemicals for these receptors in our brain all by ourselves. And one of these chemicals that they discovered, they named anandamide, which is a Sanskrit word for supreme joy or bliss. <laughs> so that means we have these receptors to help us be balanced, our mood balanced. And what our brain does is our brain determines when we need these chemicals, they're made locally, they're used immediately, and then they're destroyed. THC is this fat soluble substance that sits right into that receptor and doesn't allow your own natural anandamides to work. Now, why this is important during development is you know, during puberty, it's a very serious time for brain development. There's a lot going on because this is a time when your brain is actually making a decision. What are we keeping? What are we getting rid of? So it's strengthening some nerves. It's myelinating some nerves and it's pruning other nerves. And what we now know is the receptors that are responsible for this are the nicotinic cholinergic receptors and the <laughs> cannabinoid one receptors in the brain. So if you put exogenous nicotine or THC into the brain during this time of development, you absolutely have no idea what you're doing and you're messing with the fine tuning. So I could say, cause I've said this before, it's not that dissimilar from trying cocaine and heroin. You're playing Russian roulette with your brain. Right. You're right. And, and that's what kids are doing, for sure. Yep. So if you yep. allow your kids to smoke marijuana because you don't think it's a big deal and you don't think it's going to hurt them, would you let them play Russian roulette with an actual gun with one bullet in it? And if the answer to that is no, 
then I'm strongly suggesting, and I think Dr. Stout is as well, that you cut off the, the use of marijuana. There you go. I, I agree completely. So That's... if someone wanted to get some of these um, white papers or look up some of this research, where is the best, best place for them to go, would you suggest? Well, um, I, I think probably the best place to go is this new organization that Ken Finn probably talked about. The and, um, Now I'm blanking on the name. That's oh. terrible. <laughs> it's an organization that they set up, the and ICAS. It has an acronym. Uh, Ken Finn is on the board for that, and uh, several other physicians are on the board for that. Is that it, ICAS? Um, I can look that up real quick. Let's see. Let's see. Is it specifically about THC? Yeah, well, it's to, specifically about marijuana, but it has to do with um, uh, mostly all the problems with it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really, let's see. Ah. Well, there's an International Cannabis Association, but I don't know if that's it. No, so, uh, just a minute. Ron, I'm glad this is not live. <laughs> yeah, because I can go back and cut all this out. <laughs> Yeah. I was trying to figure out what it is. <laughs> I-A-S-I-C. I -A That's an acronym. -C. So if you look that up, so it's I-A-S-I-C 1.org. Inter International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis. So I-A-S-I-C 1.org, and they can get the research that you've been talking yes. about. There is an incredible amount of research on this website, and I t totally recommend. That's a great place for people to go. Okay. So if you don't want to believe me and you don't want to believe the other people that have been on the podcast like Dr. Finn and you don't want to believe Dr. Stout, go to iasic one digit one dot org and look at the research. Dr. Stout, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and sharing all of your knowledge and your background and just thank you for what you're doing. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> okay. I know that some of you are going to completely disagree with this podcast and you think that ingesting or imbibing marijuana, however you want to do it is a good thing. And don't forget, I'm not talking about medical marijuana, different subject. But one of the things that Dr. Stout didn't mention, but she mentioned to us after we were done, is something called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, which is something that is caused by imbibing marijuana and can kill you. If that is something that you might have some concern about, or if you have symptoms, she, one of the things she said was about vomiting. So I don't know if you or someone you know is having an issue with that. There's a Facebook group called Cannabinoid Hyperemesis Syndrome. It's a group on Facebook, so you can check it out. Started recently, 10,000 members. You're not the only one. So um, we're gonna have another interview again next week. I thought this interview was hugely impactful. So if you're smoking marijuana, you might wanna check it out. I-A-S-I-C, I-A-S-I-C, digit one, dot org. Check it out. Don't, if you don't believe me, believe the research. You have been listening to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.